Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. is the former creator of Drone League and the current director of customer success at Tapcart, the mobile app commerce platform for Shopify's fastest growing brands. Please welcome Sahan Bharati. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I have Saran Bharati. Oh, I messed up your last name. It's all good. It's uh, it's pronounced Sahan Bharati. Sahan Bharati. I'm very excited because this is Tapcart. This is actually something new, and he just told me something that's very interesting because I know folks that listen to this show utilize this uh, system, Shopify. But before we get into all that, Sahan, please introduce yourself. Yeah, um, my name is Sahan, and uh, I'm a California native, born and raised in Santa Monica. Um, I went to Cal State Long Beach for school, uh, double majored in international business and marketing, and um, really got my uh, first stab at entrepreneurship in college. Uh, Funny enough, I, when I was going to school, uh, you know, a lot of, like a lot of students, they want to have, you know, fun when they're in college. And I noticed myself and all my friends, we were spending what little money we had to go out, chase girls, et cetera. And I figured there has to be a better way to do this to where I can still go out and have all that fun, but instead of spending money, uh, making money. And that kind of landed me in my first uh, uh, business that I was able to launch with a friend. And uh, it led us to do a ton of uh, promotional events all up and down the California coast, Vegas, Mexico, um, and gave us a very busy schedule on the weekends, uh, spring break, winter break. Uh, for for the duration of my college career, you know, after that, um, wanted to kind of pivot into something new uh, and decided I'm going to take a year off and travel around the world. So I got to backpack across South America, Australia, Asia, um, and really get to experience a different side of life. Um, Coming off of that trip, I kind of came back with a very open mind and decided to get into corporate America, as a lot of people do after school, and just immediately realized this wasn't for me um and had a little bit of struggles like exiting out of that role it was kind of um a situation to where once you're in it's hard to get out um but that motivated me to kind of pivot back into entrepreneurship and i was able to get into a new industry uh called drone racing which um what people don't know Drone racing is a mixed reality sport where people fly these racing drones that they usually build at 120, 140 miles an hour, and they wear goggles that then stream whatever the drone sees to the goggles so you can fly as if you're in the cockpit. Um, That eventually got a lot of media attention as drone was a big buzzword uh, at the time. And... um, we were able to take the concept of drone racing and really bring it to life, uh, getting uh, network contracts from ESPN, Eurosport, CVS, VC funding, non-endemic sponsorship from brands like Pepsi, uh, Dell Technologies, DHL, Mountain Dew. And so it was a great five-year run where you know I was able to take what I saw as a YouTube video online and bring it to life as a full-blown TV show. Never did anything like that. was kind of learning on the go. Um, But it was a solid five-year run, and eventually as the novelty wears off for a lot of uh, TV IP, uh, when viewership starts to segment into the next uh, big thing, um, we kind of saw the writing on the wall and decided to exit. Um, Drone racing is definitely not as big today as it was uh, a few years ago, so happy with the decision. And then after that, I uh, was kind of looking for my next opportunity and met one of the founders at Tapcart, kind of told him my story. He was like, you got to come in and meet the team. Um, I was actually going in for a sales interview and then, uh, three hours later, um, they said, Hey, like, we really like your story. Uh, we know you'd be good at sales, but we really need help with 
our existing customer base and given your background in uh, technology project management and just, you know, kind of being a jack of all trades, can you work uh, on our CS team as an account manager and, and service our top accounts? And um, I said, sure, I'll give it a try. Came on as the first account manager. And now three years later, um, you know, been promoted twice. Now I'm the director of customer success and have a team of uh, 15 people that report to me. And so it ended up being a really uh, cool opportunity that I wasn't expected, but um, most good things in life aren't. And, and it ended up working out really well. You know, that's a really, really interesting story because it, it was, it's kind of like you went to corporate America. It's like a pendulum. You went to corporate America, then you went to hardcore solo entrepreneurship, and then you settled in between like the startup corporate world where you're like, not the true, I mean, you're, you're certainly helping build this brand, right? Uh, but there's yep. certainly a founder you mentioned, but you're still like in that startup entrepreneurship world. Yeah, exactly. It's definitely um, the mi- the best mix of both where it's like super bootstrap startup to corporate America. I think Tapcart kind of finds that that balance in the middle, which is likely why, you know, the company has found so much success. Anytime you go too far to the extreme, um, you know, it doesn't always work for most people. And so uh, this case, I think the balance that it provides um, has been not only great for myself, but uh, all 156 plus employees that we have at the company. Now let's talk about Tapcard. Let's, let's, t- let's get into that a little bit. For the listeners yeah. at home, what is Tapcard? Yeah, great question. So um, Tapcard is a mobile app platform for Shopify. So basically if you're a merchant that has a website using Shopify um, and you essentially sell physical goods on that site, um, at some point you may decide to get a little bit more serious about your retention strategy and decide that instead of just having a website, you want a little bit more real estate on the mobile phone, maybe even a dedicated marketing channel like push notifications. So you start exploring the opportunity of a mobile app. And most e-commerce businesses, you know, they run on lean teams. There's not endless capital. So they can't afford to uh, build a custom app that's very maintenance heavy, um, requires dedicated developers, et cetera. So SaaS platforms like Tapcart allow small businesses or even large businesses to basically get an app up and running in a matter of days. Um, And because we're SaaS based, all the maintenance and support is very much handled by us. And all you have to do is, you know, help assist with the design creation, which you can drag and drop everything into place and then work with our team to uh, roll out a consistent marketing strategy that'll make sure that the app um, gets its, you know, 15 minutes of fame every month, quarter, whatever the cadence is for the business um, to ensure that there's always a nice steady stream of new downloads as well as uh, existing sales that, you know, tend to compound uh, as time goes on. So, um, Tapcart, you know, we tend to think of ourselves as the industry leader within the Shopify space. We have uh, a lot of the big uh, Shopify apps um, with brands like Fashion Nova, Princess Polly, uh, Brandy Melville, Chubby's, um, you know, the list goes on. And so uh, given the kind of, the, I, I guess you would call it the e-commerce bump that everyone saw during the lockdown phase of the pandemic, um, that took the business uh, to really the next level because uh, so many brands were, were seeing like all time highs and we're deciding to kind of diversify, become more omni-channel present. And so a lot of interest came into the mobile app space. And, you know, the big value prop that we provide is that mobile apps really do two things. Um, they help increase the business's lifetime, uh, customer lifetime value, and they help reduce customer retention costs. So there is a ratio that every, you know, e-com business looks at, which is LTV to CAC or in our case, CRC, which is either customer acquisition or customer retention costs. The lifetime value is how much is how how much is that customer worth? And you can quantify that. Shopify has their own formula that's been widely adopted. And then the, the retention uh, cost is really how much does it cost to actually maintain that, that customer? And so most businesses look for a three to one ratio, which is kind of the golden goose of the industry. 
And what we found with the app is like time and time again, we would end up hitting that ratio because uh, app users, uh, you know, they tend to convert at a higher rate. Uh, when they buy, they end up spending more than a traditional user. Um, and they tend to end buy more often um, than, than a standard user. So all of these metrics ended up increasing the profitability of the app user against the website user. When you mix that with the retention savings that you get with an app. So when you think about how do e-commerce brands retain uh, customers? Well, they can run paid ads on social. They can send email campaigns. They can send SMS campaigns. All of these things end up costing you money. And so the one thing they all have in common is that the cost is very much relative to how many people you're, you're sending this message to and how often you're sending it to. And um, that cost can get quite expensive, uh, especially if they're not, if those, those campaigns aren't converting. Whereas with push notifications, you can send uh, as many notifications as you want to as many people as you want, and it doesn't change the fixed subscription costs um, that you pay for Tapcart on a monthly basis. So this allows our customers to get much more creative, experiential, where um, not only can they send the transactional messages that everyone's used to, so these are like sales, new products, et cetera, but um, they were able to now focus on non-transactional messaging, which is meant to drive more inspiration and curiosity. And uh, what we found is that these types of messages very much resonate with consumers. They help unlock purchases that you wouldn't otherwise receive if you uh, didn't send that messaging. And then it drives a lot better like customer engagement because the brand is less of like a, a, a sales channel in the sense that you're constantly pushing uh, promotional campaigns and they can be become more of a, a relationship channel because now you're learning new things, you're, you're getting information, uh, you're understanding benefits of the product, of the business, even things like them, um, contributing back to their community through charitable events or uh, um, sustainability initiatives. So um, collectively, you know, the app was able to unlock all of this for our merchants. And um, because the data, I'd say like nine out of 10 times is very much on our side, um, we've been able to kind of pitch this narrative to, to all of our customers. Um, and then they see it come true once they uh, launch the app, follow our playbook and um, kind of watch the sales come in. Now that's, man, so I feel like this app kind of does really, it's like a one-stop shop for folks that are truly trying to target consumers, at least, at least from the, um, the, the online merchant space. In fact, I think to the, to your point, the pandemic, you know, I was talking to the owner of uh, the CFO of baseballism and you know what happened with their sales channels, you know, during the pandemic, they kind of had to use Shopify and things of that nature and, and funnel everything towards their online channels because all the physical channels were closed. So all the, all your sales channels are gone, right? Yeah, I mean, Shopify saw a huge surge uh, during that phase. Their stock was uh, went incredibly high as well. And, um, you know, the pendulum, like you referred to earlier, always swings. So now that we're out of the lockdown phase and we're kind of coming back to business as usual, you're starting to see this resurgence of retail. Um, which is good for the industry as a whole. You know, you want businesses to not have all their eggs in one basket. You can't just have an app, you know, so you need a website. Ideally, if you can afford a retail store, great, or um, sell warehousing. So, uh, oh, sorry, sell wholesaling so you can then get into a retailer um, that can then push your goods. And so collectively, we're seeing the industry kind of head back into that direction. Um, but even with the with the rise of uh, retail, you know, the app is still very much uh, an anchor for many of our businesses. We tend to be the second most popular sales channel behind the website. Um, and we're now even focusing on experiences that can allow people to buy online, pick up in store or, you know, scan a product in store uh, with a Q, uh, that has a barcode and then the product will pull up on the app so they can get more information or even using things like uh, App Clips, which is a kind of a micro app that Apple uh, rolled out a few years ago, but allows you to kind of test the app without having to download it. And so you can trigger one of those in store um, for, through a variety of different means, creating um, a, a much more robust experience for your customers. And ultimately, if they like your store and they want to take 
your brand on the go, they can scan that QR code, download the app and continue shopping after they leave. You know, that, that's a great point too, that you made in, in regards to um, who the kind of who your target audience is. And it really is kind of almost all entrepreneurs, because when you think about it, you know, the, the beginning stage entrepreneur, those, those aspiring entrepreneurs, they tend to be the solo entrepreneur focusing on just the online channel like myself, right? That is in fact my space that I, I primarily focus on. Now let's go back to your uh, drone days. I would love to know how did you build that brand? Like that's that's very unique because it was a you're you're kind of a pioneer without a frontier, right? So how did yeah. you build that brand? Yeah, that was a, a very well crafted uh, um, exercise in terms of like how did you get a concept like drone racing front and center? And I think some of it was just the fact that it was a buzzword and got a ton of earned media. So when we did one of our first events, which was the uh, 2015 drone nationals, it was at the uh, California state fair in Sacramento. Um, we had roughly 200 pilots from around the country sign up, built this racetrack in a stadium, kind of had no idea what to expect. And I remember on day one, every news publication I've ever looked up to from uh, Showtime sports, CNN, LA times, New York times, bunch of international publications, they somehow found out that this event existed, sent the reporters, showed up, and then next next day, we were front page news. And from there, I kind of saw my inbox start to fill up uh, <laughs> with all sorts of requests. What is drone racing? How can I invest in drone racing? Um, so much so that the Crown Prince of Dubai reached out, um, and we ended up uh, flying out there and hosting a large project called the World Drone Prix. Um, it ended up costing, I think, $17 million. And we gave away about a million dollar grand prize to a 15 year old kid who won. Um, and so when you have a lot of like big marquee uh, events like that, that provide a lot of social proof, um, it does really help legitimize the idea. Uh, on top of that, uh, the the drone racing community was also very uh, active online. So it went from a couple hundred people to a couple thousand people to a couple million people very quickly. Um, and given the the uh, scale that it saw, um, a lot of the numbers, at least from an investment standpoint, looked very promising. So I think if we were to like tie it all back together, it was a combination of earned media, community. Uh, engagement. And then if you ever looked at a drone race on, on YouTube, you know, I, I encourage anyone to go uh, search for that after this, um, you'll kind of look at the footage. And if you've never seen it before, it is kind of, it is mesmerizing. It's amazing. It, I've seen it on ESPN. I'm going to tell you folks, yeah. you have to check it out. It is the coolest thing ever. Yeah. It's so cool. So um, what it lacks in uh, being hard to understand in real time, as far as like the sport, who's first, who's not, because it's so fast paced, the content is actually quite compelling. So much so that um, the film industry has now poached all the ex racing pilots and now they've hired them to be their uh, cinematographers. So we, we see a lot of our big uh, former pilots like Johnny FPV, um, who now is filming movies with Michael Bay and James Gunn, et cetera. So um, the industry kind of exploded from there and, and is still continuing to grow. Uh, but I think, you know, the lesson I really learned in that is that with, with drone racing is that I was unhappy with um, my current job and I wasn't getting any traction leaving that job. So I knew I had to kind of throw a Hail Mary. And um, I would say the challenges that drone racing had, you know, you have to deal with the FAA, you have to deal with local municipalities, lots of legal red tape that wasn't really defined because no one really knew how to regulate drones at the time. And then if you scale that to international, um, so governments, uh, it gets very complicated on top of things like radio frequency, et cetera. So it was a quite a challenge to put together, but I think my perseverance or persistence, I should say, is really what helped kind of uh, move it forward. And so anytime we were to face a challenge, we would find a solution to it for better or worse. And that allowed us to kind of get to that next step. So it was definitely not something that 
um, you know, there was like a, a direct playbook to say, do X, Y, and Z and you'll succeed. Like we took it one day at a time. And I think it was only because of that um, we were able to kind of maneuver this gauntlet of challenges um, so much so that even our competitors, once they got some traction, threw us a couple of curveballs. I remember um, we were doing a uh, project with DHL and Formula E in New York in 2016. We were going to set the Guinness World uh, Record for the fastest drone in the world. And um, we had everything ready to go. And I'm pretty sure the information leaked through uh, either some of our pilots or, or, or sponsors and got into the hands of one of our competitors. And I remember waking up that morning, opening up my phone and seeing an article saying one of our competitors just uh, hit the Guinness World Record for the fastest drone in the world. So they literally beat us by one day and we had to scrap the entire project. So, uh, you know, if you take that one uh, incident and multiply it by a hundred, those were the challenges that we faced. But I think, if, you know, if you're motivated and you want to stay uh, persistent to, to really win the race, um, we were able to take situations like that, learn from our mistakes, turn it around, and then come back hungrier the next day to make sure that, you know, we can keep the momentum moving forward. So it was a really interesting uh, uh, experience. Um, one, I wouldn't trade for anything just because I learned so much. But um, yeah, I'm excited to kind of uh, put that behind me and now focus on uh, the, the tap cart, which is the industry I'm currently or the company I'm working at today. You know, that's a great, great entrepreneurship story because I think a lot of entrepreneurs are going to have those moments of, um, you know, difficulty. How did you continue to persevere and, and what, what's, what's your drive? What keeps you going? Yeah, I, I funny enough, when I was uh, before college, I was never really a competitive person. And in fact, I you know, I, I would find myself a lot more passive. And I think once I went to college, I, I joined a fraternity, um, you know, and you put yourself around 60, 70 guys, like competition becomes oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, very big. It's, it's not like the number one thing. And so I think during college and ever since I left college, I was just competitive to be successful, you know, either um, against, you know, my own standards or even some of my friends. And um, that drive really kept me me going to a point to where like um, losing was not an option. So if it was staying up all day long, 24 hours to, to get something prepared for the next day, that's just what it took. If it meant to go live in Dubai for a couple of weeks, you know, away from um, my, my significant other, um, look, that's what it took. So I really was just kind of just rolling with the punches to ensure that whatever we needed to do to get to that next step, regardless of how hard it was, um, we were going to figure it out and then um, it basically get to that next step. And so that, I think, process, like I said, helped us kind of uh, conquer these challenges one day at a time and, um, and led us to our success. And, you know, I use that same mentality here at Tapper when the company um, first launched, Oh, I sorry. When I first started working there and there was no account management team, I had to quickly learn what makes an app successful uh, without having any mobile app experience in the past. So I started doing a little bit of research, talking to our merchants, looking at the industry, um, even non e-commerce based apps, what they did to kind of gain their footing. And I quickly realized uh, it comes down to three fundamental categories. Um, and those are design, marketing and technology. So on the design side, uh, and look, I, I had no design skills prior to Tapcart. Um, I quickly realized if an app doesn't look good or meet consumer expectations, it's going to get deleted off the phone within 30 seconds of it being downloaded. So e-com brands, you know, they're very uh, bootstrapped on time. So how can we take a good looking website and then recreate that on the app? Our customers weren't doing it on their own. And so I had to find a way to bridge the gap. So I taught myself how to design um, using an app called Sketch. And I started designing apps one by one. Um, and I got really good at it to the point to where I'd start demoing these designs to merchants. They're like, let's push this live immediately. And then we'd follow up two weeks later, 
And an app that was making $2,500 in sales was now making sixty dollars to $100,000 in sales, just within a two-week time frame. And so we quickly realized like, hey, there is something here. And so we ended up um, hiring a couple of graphic designers to basically design the app from the bottom up uh, before a merchant comes onto their kickoff call. So when they show up to kick off implementation, they have this like world-class design put together, which helps reduce the, the time to live and really motivates them to see what's possible and uh, kicks off the relationship on a good foot. So that was a, a good lesson that was learned through, you know, just firsthand experience. And we were able to find a way to scale it to now every customer has this experience. And even our sales team has started to do this uh, for prospects because um, seeing is believing. And if a prospect can see a really polished app with their logo, their assets, everything, they're more likely to kind of uh, buy into that deal or, or find out more information. The next, you know, pillar was marketing. And, you know, it's one thing if you have an app, even if it looks good, it doesn't matter if nobody knows about it. So how do we get uh, users to kind of, uh, a, understand that this business has an app and then provide some incentive to get them to download. So um, we quickly looked at what these brands were doing marketing wise to begin with. And, you know, a lot of brands have monthly drops or big sales that they announce. And these campaigns kind of cycle on, on a monthly basis. So we realized, all right, we have to kind of create the same thing for the app. However, there needs to be some sort of unique incentive for the app that's separate from the site. And so we came up with these app exclusive promotions where you can launch a product or discount exclusively on the app. And even if you do that, once again, if nobody knows about it, it doesn't matter. So we started using our designers to build marketing collateral for social email, all of the popular channels, showed our merchants how to basically post these assets that we made for them to then highlight the promotion, like, hey, we're having uh, uh, an app exclusive sale for 24 hours, or there's a flash sale we're going to call Appy Hour uh, <laughs> for the next two hours. And um, once they started marketing the app externally, we saw this flood of downloads and sales. Um, and all of those downloads, you know, ended up converting into uh, uh, existing users. So Every time we ran an app exclusive, usage would go up significantly. And then you could see the compounding effect. So an app that was making 10K a month is now making 20K a month consistently because they were able to double their users. Um, and little by little, that compounding effect started to pay off more and more. Um, so much so that now a lot of our businesses are doing 20 to 30 percent of their, their total sales through the app, which is great. And then finally, the technology piece, you know, that's really just making sure that the app. Um, is kind of best in class, you know, we obviously have other competitors out there, so our product needs to be better than them, but our product also has to be better than the website, because in some ways we do compete uh, against the website because a user can go to the website or they can go to the app. So how do we make the incentive or the experience on the app better than the site? Um, that has led us through many long product discussions that has ultimately uh, led to the platform that we have today, um, which I think a lot of our customers find super successful. So, uh, you know, just to recap, I think based on talking to our merchants and kind of evaluating the market, we really found that the three pillars to success were design, marketing, and technology. And these are the same three pillars that we use today for, um, you know, all of our uh, new hires when we train them on the CS side in terms of what makes a successful app. and. Um, one thing, you know, from this lesson that I thought was super valuable is that a lot of these ideas came from me talking to my customers and it's only there where I learned, you know, these strategies are most effective. And I think a lot of businesses overlook this idea of being your own customer. Um, and why, why I find that to be so important is that you know, many businesses that are spending thousands, in some cases, millions of dollars to hire these consulting firms or customer research firms to find out what they should do next. And sometimes those agencies get it right. Sometimes they get it wrong. Um, you end up signing a pretty big check nonetheless. Uh, 
But what we found, and even some of our own merchants that are in the D2C space, it's actually a lot cheaper and more effective to just ask your customers directly, what do you want to see from us next? And um, I think because we got so good at capturing customer feedback and passing it to the right channels, um, a lot of the new features that we've rolled out have been very much in line with what the industry wants. And that's allowed our business to grow. And we see that with many of our merchants as well. So one of our customers, which is a company called Myavi, they make uh, flavored collagen. Um, they found a gap in the market by actually using um, Google to see what was trending and, and what wasn't being fulfilled. And so they came up with this flavored collagen concept that they rolled out. And once it was out and um, they were kind of looking to like, how should they diversify the product or really what is the next flavor that they should make that's going to do well? Instead of guessing, they turned to their community and asked them directly, hey, what flavor should we make next? Everyone chimed in. Uh, the community was able to vote on it. They were able to pick a winner, um, uh, a winning flavor out of the selection. And then they told everyone, hey, in four to six weeks, this flavor is going live. And then as a result of that, they had this nice four to six week like buildup where everyone was getting hyped uh, for this new flavor that they were able to influence. Um, and so when they when that flavor eventually launched, it would sell out within minutes because uh, it was fully in line with what their customer was wanted. And the entire campaign spoke to the fact that they asked, they listened, and now they're giving the people what they want. And I think for a lot of businesses, you know, you don't need to overthink what your next move is or what your value proposition is or the benefits that you provide your, your customers. Just talk to them and you're likely to get a better answer than anyone who's not connected to your company would charge you a pretty penny for it. You know, that's that's a great, great point right there. And first and foremost, engaging your consumers in the way that company did to kind of really make those individuals feel that they were part of this decision making because they were right. They're part of this decision making yep. process. And that creates that sense of um, kind of like ownership and like I now need to support like this was my decision. I need to kind of go out. And that's why they sold out probably so quickly, but also just that organic marketing. Right. Because now you, those individuals who probably voted on that that flavor, they might have been so in, in, you know enticed to actually go to their social media. And be like, hey, please vote on this flavor that I also like. Right. Creating more awareness to the brand. And then it's just a very organic way to do that. But then I, I really I really do like that concept because I think that's something I need to probably do a little bit more here on the podcast as well. How do I figure out ways to engage with the consumer? One. But two, what do you want? Right. What what do you find value? And in this this is something, you know, I've talked about constantly is uh, perceived value. Right. What, what a consumer is willing to pay. Right. You talked about LTVs. Right. How much is going to pay to keep these uh, uh, clients. Right. And so it's, it's very interesting how that just works out organically. A small little idea like that just engaging your consumers. And so folks, listen, I hope you really kind of took note of that example because that is a free way for you to engage your consumers. You can do it on social media. You can do it on a podcast. You can do it on a newsletter, right? You can do it any, any type of channel you choose, but it's just a re really unique way to engage your consumers and really kind of get them um, really, really become a loyal consumer. Cause right, you're going down this, the, going down the sales funnel, right? You're trying to create a really loyal customer and that's just one way to do it. Now, what would you say? Cause you've, you went from entrepreneurship or your corporate America entrepreneurship into I'm not sure. Would you say Tapcart is a startup? Are you pretty established? Very much, very much a startup. Okay, so you went from corporate America to entrepreneurship to the startup world. What has been difficult about that? Yeah, great question. Um, I, you know, each type of uh, career path, I think, has its own set of challenges and, and benefits, and I think the difficulty. I had was really figuring out which one was right for me. Um, you know, when you start out as a college grad, um, like most kids, you know, they don't really know what they want to do. They, they kind of have an idea, but uh, they don't have any experience in it. And so once you start hitting the job market, you kind of take what you can get initially to start out. Um, and that doesn't always align with, uh, you know, your, your long-term goals in life. So I think, for me, um, the difficulty was at least taking 
a risk by starting a job that I didn't necessarily know that if it was something I'd want to do or if it was going to work out and then seeing what was happening, seeing what was going to happen. And as a result, um, you know, I did strike out a couple of times in the sense that like I moved from uh, my own company to this corporate job uh, after I graduated, hated it. Um, but what I learned during that, that phase of my career was really just how to be like extremely professional because that's where corporate culture excels at, you know, how to be polite, how to be formal, because I think when you work with, you know, more senior executives at larger companies, that's kind of the, the culture they have. And it was, it allowed me to kind of align with that. Um, and a lot of those things that I learned during that phase of my career, I still use today. Um, but ultimately, you know, it wasn't for me. And so I struggled to make that next pivot into drone racing, which ended up being a five-year run where I probably worked harder than I ever have physically and mentally um, to only end up losing again because the, the drone racing industry, um, you know, lost a lot of its novelty. There was some cannibalization as well. So uh, what was so tough is that at the time, we all thought we had this kind of golden ticket to um, really hitting the jackpot with a concept that no one thought about and was going to be the next big thing. And for a while, it was poised to do that. But eventually, uh, the, the numbers, I, I would say, weren't sustainable enough to kind of make it uh, a timeless kind of uh, sport or, 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 or concept. And so as a result of um, that the industry kind of imploding, you know, it sucked because I was like, well, you know, after putting all this time, energy and money into this, I'm essentially having to start from scratch again. Um, and that's where I kind of landed into Tapcart. And I would say out of all the jobs that I've had, Tapcart is definitely my favorite one to date, only because it's the most well-rounded, the people, the culture, the product, all of that, all of those things are dialed in a way that has allowed the company to scale um, in ways that drone racing could never do. Um, and the, the experience for someone like me who works here is far more fulfilling than anything corporate America could provide. So I think I had to learn what I didn't want to eventually land into um, what I did want. And I think you know, if you look at my career history, 10, 15 years, that wasn't necessarily an easy journey, but I'm very happy with the destination, which is being able to um, have a really good career at Top Part. And, um, you know, the, the experience has been uh, amazing thus far, meaning like probably my favorite team I've worked with to date, everyone's just so hungry for success. No one kind of slacks off um, or, or just treats this as like a job. Like they're very committed into winning. And so when you have a group of people that kind of have that same mindset, you're able to take a company from, you know, small amount of ARR to, you know, what we have today, which is um, significantly larger than when, when I started. And when I uh, first started, I was the 19th hire. Now we have close to 160 employees. So definitely a huge amount of scale. Um, but, you know, that journey in itself, it wasn't easy, but I'm happy with how it ended up. And I probably wouldn't change anything. Love it. Now, what advice would you have for aspiring entrepreneurs from your experience, either in corporate America, from drone racing to now with Tapcard? What advice would you have? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, don't be afraid to take risks. Um, I know I was earlier on in my career, but uh, I have found that taking risks, whether they win or, or lose, tend to be uh, some of the most rewarding things in my career because, you know, you, you always miss the opportunities you don't take. And sometimes you can be presented with a situation that can very be can be very life changing. Um, I remember when I first uh, got into drone racing, uh, I I was still working at the bank, and I had to basically take a chance of quitting that job, cutting off all my income, and seeing if this was going to work out. Um, and I think by by taking that that risk, it basically put me in a state to where I was like, I can't physically afford to let this fail. And it pushed me to basically make it work. And it did work for, for a good amount of time. And, you know, same thing with Tapper, like 
I was getting into a, a role that I was, I've never worked in before being a uh, customer success, never had a goal to work in it as well either. Uh, but was open to the idea, especially because the, the need was um, so in demand at the company. Um, but I ended up really liking it. And in many ways, I think traditional CS tends to kind of operate by its own playbook, but um, by not having a CS background and really just looking at the objective of what does it take to make an app successful? And we're not going to stop at anything to pull that off. That ended up cat um, catapulting my career within Tapcart and the success of the company far, far further than any sort of like traditional playbook that um, was probably less risky at the time, but uh, definitely not as innovative. So I think taking risks is just a part of doing business. And um, you're not like many uh, entrepreneurs, you can listen to Elon Musk, you know, he'll tell you that he's failed more times than he's succeeded, but where he succeeded, you now have Tesla, SpaceX, um, some of the biggest brands in the world. So, you know, plan on failing more often than winning, but you only need to win once or twice to really hit it big. And I think um, we see that consistently across the board within the entrepreneur space. That is a great point. In fact, you know, one thing I, I tell listeners often, in fact, I don't think I've mentioned this quote in some episodes. Uh, one quote I always use is I've never failed a day in my life. I either learn or I succeed. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's very true. And uh, failure tends to be at least one of the best teachers in, in my lifetime, uh, only because it stings. Um, and that sting is why you remember the lesson that, you know, uh, that that failure taught you. And hopefully uh, the takeaway is that you, you've learned that lesson and make yourself better for it in the long run so that you don't repeat that mistake when that scenario comes up again in the future. And I think as long as you can learn from your mistakes, um, you will continue to progress in a positive way within your within your business or industry. I definitely agree. Now, for the folks at home that want to connect with you, maybe they want to learn more about TapCard. Where can they find you on the internet? Maybe social media. Where can they get in? Where can they slide into your DMs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, definitely uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me at Sahan Barati if you just search for that. Um, or you can use my email at sam at tapcart.co. The reason why it's Sam is that when I started, there was another uh, employee with, that had my same name, which is a rare name wow, yeah. to begin with. <laughs> and him and I, uh, he still works here. He was the first employee at Tapcart, so he has seniority. And we were on the same team. He was on implementation. I was on account management. So we would essentially like kick off and launch every one of these accounts. And to have two people with the name Sahan on a call can be quite confusing. So I uh, adopted uh, the, the nickname of Sam. Um, and so, yeah, Sam at tapcart.co. Um, I very much uh, like monitor my email religiously. So if you, you send something, uh, I'll be sure to respond. Um, yeah, ha happy to answer any questions. Love it. Love it. Sahan Barati, thank you so much for your time. This was a great episode. This is a very good conversation. Um, I'm going to check in your stuff because I think, this is, I think the, the, you know, the online area is kind of where the brand is going to be mostly, uh, mostly successful. I don't see any brick and mortar coming on anytime soon. Although I think that might be the aspiration one day we'll get into that for the folks listening at home. You can go ahead and subscribe to the newsletter. We'll have tap card information on the newsletter. It will be there. You can subscribe at the shades of e.com. You can also follow us on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram at the shades of E. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.